Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire Breathing Rob. Definitely share these videos, like, and subscribe. We're trying to build up our subscription list, and we really appreciate that. Everything is free, by the way. We're not charging. We know it's a time of coronavirus, and a lot of people don't have a lot of funds in general. So we appreciate you listening to this great progressive podcast. We have an amazing person and someone that I feel like it's an honor and a privilege to listen to every time he comes on. And this is Professor Richard Wolf, and he is a legendary economist. If you go to his website, it's www.rdwolff.com. And he is also the host of Economic Update and the founder of Democracy at Work. Professor Wolf, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming back. I'm glad to be here, Rob, really. Professor Wolf, we saw Amazon's cashed in throughout this crisis, but I want to talk about something that you know, not a lot of people bring up, and we know Barack Obama helped this company out on the way out of office, and it's called Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone did some serious damage to this country throughout the housing crisis. If we see a lot of people, because there's 40% of this country that our rent is, if we see a lot of foreclosures, which we probably will, let's be honest, with that said, is Blackstone going to pick up the pieces again and really, you know, kill the market? Because they own so much property in this country, it's insane. Yes, and they're going to be joined, they have already been joined by other big uh, capitalists, people who gather money. You know, if you're very wealthy in America, you give your money to one of these companies, like a Blackstone or a BlackRock or Vanguard or any one of a, a, a dozen Goldman Sachs. That's what they do. They collect money from wealthy people. They collect money from, from wealthy families, big corporations. And then they look for opportunities that you can only grab if you have an enormous amount of money. And one of the opportunities is to take advantage. I mean, it's, it, it's horrible, it makes you cry. It, I see it as an economist. You take advantage of the fact that you're screwing the mass of people. Those people who bought homes, that's what you're talking about, who bought yeah. homes because someone told them, here's a mortgage you can carry, you can pay this every month. Those others said, oh, look, now we have a pandemic. They lost their job. They lost their income. Yeah. They're going to have to give up the house. And they're going to, suddenly there's going to be all these houses thrown on the market because the banks foreclose. Well, who are the banks? The banks don't want to be the owner of a home. That's not what they're in the business for. That's a losing proposition. Good, said Blankstone. We'll come along. We'll cut a deal with the, with the banks. You foreclose on Monday, we'll buy the house from you on Tuesday. You won't have anything. We'll take care of it. But you got to give us a good price. How does the bank give you a good price? By screwing the homeowner and saying, this house is only... That's why so many people discovered that the value of their house was lower than the money they still owed on it. Why? Because the handler understood if I can get away with giving this poor schmuck a low price on the house he hasn't paid off of, I can turn it around and sell it to Blackstone the next day for a hundred thousand dollars more. I make the money. The, the, the poor guy lost his home after he paid in half the equity and Blackstone walks away with a bargain, does a little bit of renovation and rents it out. To people who can't own. I mean, so you have, think of these as capitalists who are scavengers. They're the capitalists who feed on the failure of capitalism to work for large numbers of people. You're going to see more and more and more of that. Yeah. Here's it's another really one. Sad. You're going to yeah. convert a lot of stores. This is what happens in all poor countries. A lot of stores are now going to set up Payment programs. You don't have to pay the full price of whatever you're buying, a, a, a set of dishes or um, furniture or whatever it is. You can pay over time, mm -hmm. but you're going to end up paying more over time. It, it's just, it's endless. And there'll be banks that come in and who make that money available to the storekeeper. So he gets the money for the chair 
and you end up paying the bank back more money than you would have had to pay if you bought the chair outright. There's endless ways to rip money off of poor people if you make them desperate. And you're going to see that. You're going to see it more and more. This country is in deep trouble. And this yeah. is the truth. And thank you for telling the truth. Because like you said, Professor Wolf, when you listen to the news, it's just a lot of gobbledygook. They just spread a lot of propaganda. It's not the truth of what's really going on. And speaking about this and you know what the truth is of really what's really going on, we hear Trump and even Democrats spew these talking points that the stock market is at a record high. The economy's right. doing great. Jobs are coming back from the coronavirus. Can you tell the viewers, because a lot of people buy into this, and we hear this from Trump supporters a lot, and even Democrats uh, that vote for Democrats say the same thing, that jobs are coming back. Why is that not true? Can you tell these people this? Sure. Uh, let me start, though, with a metaphor. Suppose you went to a doctor because you weren't feeling real well. So you went to the doctor, you told the doctor what you do, and the doctor said, okay, I'm going to take your temperature. Okay, so the doctor gives you the thermometer, takes your temperature, tells you, you have 98.6, that's a normal temperature, you're fine, go home. My hope is that you would never go to that doctor again, because you're a smart human being, and you understand that the human body is a complicated thing, you don't understand what shape it's in by doing any one measurement. That's why a good doctor looks in your ear and looks in your nose and, and gives you a blood test and gives you an x-ray and goes through a whole bunch of things to get a picture. All right. When you look at an economy, it's exactly the same way. The reason you see the attention paid to the stock market is it's virtually the only good indicator that anyone can point to now because the prices in the stock market have gone up. Meanwhile, businesses are closed everywhere in America. Millions of people are unemployed. And you can look at the numbers, they go up, they go down. But the reality is the economy is a disaster. So let, now let's explain though the one, the one piece of good news, the stock market. Well, here, here's the explanation, it's not complicated. When the economy tanks, and capitalist economies tank on average every four to seven years. Right. And look, we had a crash in the spring of 2000. We call it the dot-com crash. We had another crash in the 2008. We call the subprime mortgage crash. And now we have a crisis in 2020. We call it the uh, coronavirus crash. Three crashes in the first 20 years. That's about six point whatever it is average number of years between, and that's been capitalism's history for 300 years. It's an unstable system. It always was. What, does the, what happens when it crashes? One of the things that happens is that the central bank in any capitalist country, which means in our country, the Federal Reserve, throws money into the economy. It literally, in the old days, it printed up dollar bills and $10 bills and all the rest. Nowadays, it just clicks into an account in banks. It creates money. And the idea is very simple. If you create money and you make it readily available by dropping interest rates very low, you hopefully will stimulate individuals to borrow more, businesses to borrow more, and spend it and create demand and jobs and all of that. Okay, so they threw more money into the economy starting in March of this year than they have ever done before. Much more even than they did in 2008, and that was much more than what they did in 2000. Okay, but here was the problem. Because millions of people were out of work, all of that money did not go into hiring people or to producing more. Why? Simple reason. If you've got millions of people unemployed, they're not in a position to buy large quantities of stuff. So you're not going to produce more 
because you can't even sell the inventory you already had. So the money didn't go into producing more. The money couldn't do that. Where did the money go? Into the stock market. And it drove up the prices. Here's what all every banker in this country did. He said, wow, I can now borrow limitless amounts of money from the Federal Reserve, and I don't have to pay hardly anything in interest, half of a percent, three quarters of a percent. That's what the Federal Reserve was charged. So limitless amounts of money at no cost, virtually no cost. This was like a party. Every capitalist borrowed money. What did he do? He went into the stock market buying shares. Why? Because he knew other people would be doing exactly what he did. And that three weeks from now or three months from now, I can sell the shares I bought to another person just like me who's doing the same thing, buying my shares in the hopes of reselling them. So the only place to make money with your money, the only place to earn profits has been the stock market. Everything else, with the exception of a handful of high-tech companies like Amazon, that's a different story. But for your average capitalist across the country, the only way to make money was to play in the stock market. And so the prices of stocks have gone crazy. Let me warn you, as a professor of economics, and for everyone listening, this story has happened many times in the history of capitalism. And here's how it always ends up. We call it a bubble. And we call the end of it the bursting of the bubble. And that's when the people who buy shares with all the easy money make a, a decision. Uh-oh, the bubble is going to burst. I don't want to get stuck with shares when the bottom falls out and their prices collapse. So the very fear that we're in a bubble is already the first sign that it's about to burst. And everybody gets out, which is the burst. They bring to pass the very thing they feared. And that's how this will end too. Whether that happens this week or next week, my guess is it isn't going to happen until after the election. Because Mr. Trump knows that if the only positive thing going on in the American economy today is the stock market. If that upswing were to burst before the election, then Mr. Trump's presidency is over. And so he is doing everything he can imagine to prevent that from happening. But nobody should think our economy is in good shape. Nobody should. The vast majority of people who are wealthy have been moving their money out of stocks, have been moving their money out of the United States because it is too dangerous here. Is that a prediction of like a 1929 crash then? Is that what you're saying, Professor? Well, unless something big changes, yep, that's what we're facing. We're Jeez. facing a bubble on the stock market. And of course, that will make the underlying economy, that's another hit that the mass of people will take. It'll be another, you know, it'll be another pressure from the people who own the shares for the government to step in, to do the things that move the share prices back up. They will neglect the average person because all of their focus will be on doing what's good. That, look, that's what's been happening since March. We don't have a government that provides masks to everybody. We don't have a government that reorganizes businesses and schools so that we can have a normal life. But we do have a government that bashes China at every chance it gets and that pumps money into the stock market. You know, you're seeing that in a capitalist system, the people at the top do what's good for them and the rest of us, we're on our own. Professor Wolf, I have three more quick questions and I'll let you go. And I, I do appreciate the insight. It's amazing, as always. 
Can you speak about this? Because we heard President Trump with the executive order uh, last week. He spoke about the payroll tax cut. My thing is, with the payroll tax cut, he wants this to go to the end of the year. And then he said if he gets reelected, he's going to try to do away with it. I don't know if he said for the rest of for forever or what he's going to do with that. I know he said he was going to delay it for quite a long time. So with the payroll tax cut, if you and you can correct me if I'm wrong, with the cut, it's going to defund Social Security and Medicare. If we do that for a long period of time, that money's not going in. That's intentionally, that's a cut to Social Security and Medicare. And people will not be uh, benefiting for those programs. And it's going to, you know, it's already in bad shape. And it's going to continue to be in bad shape, especially with this tax cut. Plus, people are not even working. So how can people benefit from the tax cut if they're not working? Well, let me explain why he did that. Number sure. one, they want to drive people back to work. Giving someone an extra $600 on unemployment is a way for people to get by without going back to work. Mm -hmm. They don't want that. They want an army of people desperate to get that job. So it's, they want to say to them, look, you can come back to work and you can do better than you did before because you won't have to pay the payroll tax. That won't be taken out of your check. So if you want some help, go back to work. But you can't stay on unemployment because we're not going to give you the $600 extra that we did give you for a while. So it's just a way to force people to go back to work, to risk their health and their safety by going into an unsafe workplace. That's number one. Number two. It is a very clever way to undercut Social Security and Medicare. I won't repeat it. You put it perfectly correctly. What, what it does is to undermine the revenue that those systems depend on, which is the payroll tax. That's how they are funded. And that's going to allow conservatives and Republicans to argue that the benefits under Medicare have to be cut or the benefits under Social Security have to be cut because the money isn't there. And why isn't the money there? Because you cut the payroll tax. Number three, saying that he's going to defer it means you may have to pay it, but in a lump sum at the end of the year when you will be told you owe the government 2000 3000 whatever the money is that's accumulated if you were able to get it. Uh, that would be a nasty surprise. And it's not a question of whether or not he wins the election. He can't do that. That's a tax. And the authority to tax lies with the House of Representatives above all else. And that's going to be controlled by the Democrats. Every predictor that I know of, left-winger, right-winger, says that the Democrats will hold on to the House of Representatives Mm -hmm. The only question is whether they will also take the Senate, but they will certainly take the House of Representatives. So he won't be able to do what he is mouthing off about. So you're, if you go with that, you're supporting two ifs. If he can even defer it, if you'll have to pay a lump sum, and if the Democrats would ever allow him to forgive all of that, he doesn't have the power to, to do that. So for all those reasons, it should be massively, massively resisted. And for me, the first thing I said is, that, is the most important. What kind of a president says to people who he, who he failed to protect from this virus, not only did you lose your job on a massive scale that other countries afflicted by this virus did not do to their working classes, even England didn't do this mass unemployment. Not only do we screw you by throwing you out of work, 50 million of you, but we're not going to give you the extra money either. We're going to force you to go back into work. And notice, no executive order whatsoever about making any workplace safe. No minimum requirement of you know, disinfecting. No minimum requirement that machines be so many feet apart. None of it. So you're, put, you're doing everything to force the worker back. You're doing nothing to force the employer 
to make a, a safe workplace. It's extraordinary, the, the, the injustice of what's going on. Professor Wolf, they were trying to pass that bill with the, with the new whatever they were trying to do, 400, 300, and they were trying to put the liability, uh, get, you know, so they were, the businesses wouldn't have that liability. So that's what you're saying. It's a joke. Yeah, it's a scam. Un unbelievable. You're forcing workers back into an unsafe situation and at the same time passing a law that exempts the employer from any responsibility for the sickness the worker contracted because he went back to work since you wouldn't give him the support on, on I mean, I, I, let me put it this way. I think future historians looking back on this period, writing up what we've been going through these last uh, six months, will shake his head or her head and wonder out loud in print, what the hell happened to the American people that they allowed this level of failure to prepare for a virus, failure to contain the virus, failure to protect the mass of people from the economic fallout? I mean, wh what, what happened? How could you not be in the street? How could you not be saying, There'll be no business as usual if you treat the mass of people in this way. You rich people, you're not going to have any profits because we're not going to work. This has to be dealt with. We're not going to be treated this way. And I think it's coming. It, it, it'll take a long time, maybe. I don't know. Americans are peculiar folks that way. But eventually, eventually, I think Americans will do what people everywhere else have done. They'll finally say, enough is enough. We're not going to tolerate this anymore. Uh, I just hope that whoever they find attractive as a leader will be the kind of person that's willing to take the necessary steps and not another theatrical performer uh, like Mr. Trump. Professor Wolf, last three questions on the Bi on Joe Biden and if he wins his administration. We saw in the past two nights, and there's two nights left, the uh, Democrats parading out Republicans in the Democratic Convention. John Kasich and the rest of the Republican gang were coming out uh, for Joe Biden. Even John McCain from uh, the deathbed, actually, they had a little uh, a video of him and Joe Biden. With that said... You know, Joe Biden, the administration that if he does win, and you as an economic professor, Professor Wolf, we see his team is already the same people that started the deregulation, that started these crises with Larry Summers and Bob Rubin. They're behind the scenes talking to fundraisers and saying, basically, we're not going to do any kind of progressive policies as far as the economy goes. It seems like it's just going to be more deregulation. Ugh. It seems like it's going to be more deregulation, and we're just going to keep trucking. So what do you think about this? Yeah, no, I think I, I have nothing to add to what you say. That's how it looks to me as well. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, I think his campaign is going to be, look at me, I'm a nicer guy than, <laughs> than Don Trump, which he is, and I'm not crazy like Trump which he probably isn't. Um, I do know something about Kamala Harris. Uh, I don't know her personally, but I know her father very well. He's an economist like me. Mm -hmm. And in case you're interested, he's an economist who is like me, who agrees with what I've been saying to you also. Right. So she has an influence from her father that is much more progressive than anything. But she's made a decision She's not going where her father went. She wants to, she's built her career on being acceptable to the establishment. So she's the right one for a Biden to pick. She's not going to do the radical anything. She never has. She's walked away from that, even though she knows what it is, because that's her father. Um, so I expect them to be returned to normal. And by normal, they mean the way things were under Bush and Clinton and Obama and all of that. And all I can tell you as an economist is that's what got us into the mess 
we're in. That's what produced the backlash of the millions of working class people. And that's why they voted for Mr. Trump. And that's why you're gonna get more Mr. Trumps long after he's gone, because you haven't changed this system. And they're hoping, and I think they're delusional, but they're hoping that they can bring us back to a normal and make sure in some magic that they've never explained to anybody, because I don't think they have it in their heads, that somehow they're going to make this normal not have the results that it had last time. And I think that's a fantasy. And as I see the difficulties of the United States on this long-term decline, uh, I would say that the probability of success from Biden and Harris is very small. As we end the interview with the last question, I just have a prediction that I'd love for you to evaluate on. We see that, you know, elections coming up in November, there's still a lot of time left. We still haven't had the Republican convention or the debates, and there could be a vaccine, which probably won't happen, but it could happen before November. With that said, do you see Biden losing this election? Well, my answer is no, I don't see him losing it. <clears throat> wow. But having said it, I remember that I didn't think Mrs. Clinton would lose the election right. either. Um, I don't know. And frankly, I am frightened. Mr. Trump is a loose cannon. Uh, he's prepared to take chances that are, in my judgment, really crazy and very dangerous. Uh, I think his provoking China is an extremely dangerous thing to do. Uh, he has no economic plan that makes any sense at all. He promised to rising exports. We don't have it. He promised to reduce the deficit. We don't have it. He promised to bring huge numbers of jobs back to the United States. We don't have it. Um, we have a failure to to uh, prepare for the virus, a failure to contain the virus, a failure to prepare for the economic downturn, a failure to contain, I mean, it is, but here's my terror. The Democrats offer so little to believe in right. that the angry American may end up voting for Mr. Trump because of frustration that, yeah, he's crazy, but maybe he'll do something. But those others, the Biden and Harris, I know what they are. They are more Clinton and Bush and nah, nah, nah. and I know that's no good. And so I'm not, you know, who knows? It, it's, everything is possible when you have a society that is, again, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but a society that's declining and that is in basically in denial doesn't want to face it. That's a society that will do very strange things. And yeah. one of them might be to reelect Mr. Trump. But I tell you this, if they do, the level of social disorder inside the United States will be more than anything we have ever seen. Yeah. Black people are not going to allow themselves to be abused the way they have through most of American history. And the working class may be slow to wake up, but as it does, watch out, because it's a very big group and it's very angry and it, it can make the changes because it's the majority. And that's what I would see as the defining uh, explosion that's gonna happen in this country, which will happen in my judgment whether Mr. Biden wins or whether Mr. Trump does. Professor Wolf, thanks so much for your time. And I know we've been on for almost an hour right now, and I do appreciate this. I'm going to make this actually in two segments. And it means a lot to really have you on as a young person. I listen to you all the time on YouTube, and it's just we need to have more people like you in government. If we did, this country would be a whole different place. And I do appreciate you. And I appreciate that you have the courage to make this kind of program and to get it out there. That's what has to happen more and more.
So it's a pleasure working with you. All right, Professor Wolf, let's do this again down the road. Thanks so okay. much. Stay safe and have a great day, okay? You too.